Take your Bibles, please, and let's go to Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12. As we know, our brother Daniel uh, has been getting visions from the Lord. Now, he had interpreted the visions of King Nebuchadnezzar and uh, some uh, other visions that he uh, had to deal with. He read the writing on the, the wall to King Belshazzar. And so Daniel is uh, a man who is finally in tune with the Spirit of God. He is living his life in obedience to the things of God. And we know why Daniel was able to be used of God in this great way and in this great ministry. And it's because Daniel knew his his Bible. Daniel knew his Bible. And if you want to have success in your Christian life, you need to know your Bible. And you cannot get to know your Bible just by showing up to church on Sunday morning once in a while and hearing a preacher preach. Even if that preacher is preaching the Bible and preaching the truth, you need to be daily immersing yourself in the Word of God, learning it and studying it. And that's how Daniel was able to be used in this great way. So, we know Daniel has been giving us uh, his uh, vision of the kingdoms. He has given us uh, a great deal of accurate historical information through chapters 10 uh, and 11. And so in this last chapter, he gives us the final vision that the Lord gave to him and it's further details on the great tribulation. It's further details on the end of the world. And you know, uh, I, I don't know if you all remember this or will remember this or not, but Back in the 70s, and really I guess on into the 80s, prophecy conferences were a big deal. Did any of you ever attend any of those prophecy conferences? I mean, they were all over the place. And, and, and you know, you remember the, the late great planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, and there were so many other, uh, and, and there were just all kinds of movies. They were making B and C grade movies about the end times and about the rapture. And, and then along in, in, in the 90s came the Left Behind series. And so but prophecy uh, for many years was a focus in the church. Now, I'll have to say that there was an awful lot of speculation in that, uh, a lot, awful lot of things that, uh, you know, people were trying to figure out how's the rapture going to happen and what's it going to look like, and they were depicting it in ways that they imagined it would be so, and sometimes they were a little off track scripturally, but the good thing about it was is that it reminded us that Jesus is coming again, and we need to be ready, amen? Well, now, again today... There are beginning to be people who are uh, looking at the prophetic picture and they're saying, oh, it's, 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 it's here. It's right on top of us. Jesus could come at any time. Do you know that's been true for 2,000 years? I mean, God has just sort of set it up. I mean, Daniel, we're going to be reminded in Scripture that, that Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. And you all know that thieves who come in the night don't call up ahead and say, I'm coming to steal from you. No, it. They, they come unawares. So Jesus said, we have to be ready. You have to be ready to protect yourself against the thief in the night. And we need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. That's what Daniel's trying to communicate to the people of Israel and what he wants to communicate to us. Now he's giving us a look at what's going to happen. You say, pastor, do you think what's going on in the world is uh, leading to the end time? Do you think that we're right there? Yeah, of course. But we've been right there for 2,000 years. I mean, the, the, the angel said to the men who looked up as Jesus was ascending into heaven, why are you staring into heaven? He's going to come back just like he went up. And so that's the blessed hope of the church. That's our hope that Jesus is coming again. But here's what I can guarantee you. In your lifetime, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to die or Jesus is going to split the eastern sky. And you're going to meet Jesus at one or the other of those events. So be ready because you don't know when it's going to happen. And I can tell you my personal experience from, from this last year has nothing to do with COVID and pandemics. What I've learned is, is that life is short and you better be ready. You better get yourself ready. And, and it's time for pastors to quit playing patsy cake and tell the truth and preach the gospel. We need Jesus. And we need to be focused on what the Bible says. The end is coming. One way or the other, the end is coming. We need to be ready. 
Let's look at our text, Daniel chapter 12. We're just going to take four verses this morning, but they're absolutely critical to our understanding of the great tribulation and the end time. So if you have your copy of the inerrant infallible word of God and you're able, would you please stand in honor of God's word? And we're going to begin reading at Daniel chapter 12 and verse one. If you're ready for the scripture, say amen. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. May I just stop there for a moment? Everyone who is written in the book, you need to make sure you're written in the book. He's talking about the Lamb's book of life. The role of the church is not going to be the one called up yonder. The Lamb's book of life is the only book that's going to be called. Verse two, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Father, in Jesus' name, give us the heart and the ears to not only hear, but to heed the words of Daniel's prophecy and to make it a reality so that we can be more faithful in our service to you in the days that you have given us on this earth for your glory and our good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please be seated. We come to Daniel's promise for the end times. And of course, he's speaking to us about the great tribulation. And here's what I want to tell you. There's hope. There's hope. There's always hope in Jesus. Hope is one of the three words of God's great triad, faith, hope, and love. Hope is a wonderful thing. And boy, we all need a dose of hope these days, don't we? I mean, we need to hope, but we got to recognize that things are going to get worse before they get better. That's what Daniel's telling the people of God, even in their Babylonian captivity, which they've pretty well been freed from. Uh, Daniel is telling them it's going to get worse, but it will get better. There is hope. Uh, you see, God always balances negatives with positives. God will say it's going to get tough, but there's always a positive answer. There's always hope in Jesus for the believer. There's a solution. There's a savior. There is hope for a better future. So the first thing I want us to look at together in our outline this morning is the great promise of rescue in verse one. Uh, now, if you, if you go back over to chapter 11, verse 35, Daniel has already alluded to this. Remember there he said, and some of those understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white. Now listen, until the time of the end, because it is still the appointed time. You see, Daniel was saying that God wants to refine us. He wants to purify us and get us ready so that we are ready when he does come again. And so here's God's purpose spelled out plainly, refining, purifying, making them white. This is God's method. And once he's accomplished that with the people of Israel, he will fulfill his promise to rescue them. Notice verse one says very plainly, your people shall be delivered. When God says he's going to deliver, he delivers. The post office, occasionally. I called the post office the other day. I went three days with no mail in my mailbox. Now that's just weird because there's so much junk mail out there. I mean, three fourths of what I get goes in the recycle bin before I even get in the house from the mailbox. Amen. So I called them up and the lady answered the phone at our local post office. I said, did y'all go out of business? <laughs> when God says he's going to deliver, he delivers. He comes through. It means the, the, the word shall be means shall be. Your people shall be delivered. What a great truth that is. It's a promise with great hope. And that's why we preach the gospel, because there's a promise of hope. In Jesus, we can have a better future. In Jesus, we can have a better life. In Jesus, we can have a life free from sin and the molestation of the enemy. There is a deliverer. I love that song that we sang just before I preached. There is a fountain who is a king, victorious warrior, Lord of everything. My rock, 
my shelter, my very own blessed Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. Aren't you glad that's true? I'm glad Alvin Slaughter wrote those words. So what we're considering really in this 12th chapter is the last half, the most terrible half of the great tribulation. We, we saw previously how terrible that will be. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 30, he refers to it as the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Israel, we know, has suffered mightily at the hand of tyrants through the years, but nothing will compare in their suffering, nor will it compare to any suffering that we may go through as compared to the suffering that will come when the Antichrist is in power. You see, the people of Israel over the years, by and large, have rejected their Messiah. Now, there are Messianic Jews, uh, fortunately and, and, and blessedly, that who believe in Jesus as the Savior and Messiah. Uh, but for the most part, as a nation, as a race of people, they have rejected their Messiah. They didn't listen to the instructions that they were given through the prophets. And in this day and time, the day of the Great Tribulation, they will listen to Satan's counterfeit fit the Antichrist. But Daniel wants to end the book on a note of hope, that there is hope and that they can be saved if they will listen to the instruction. Now listen to me, church. Just like Israel failed to listen to the prophets, the church today is failing to listen to the preachers that God is sending to warn of the impending danger that we are in. In this great promise of rescue, we see, first of all, there's a great defender, a great defender who is the angel Michael. <clears throat> Verse one tells us that Michael shall stand up, that great prince who stands watch over the people of God. Now, listen, you probably never met one personally, but aren't you glad that his angels are ministering spirits to the saints of God? I, I can assure you, I, I know of time, I, I don't really know that I have ever had that experience where I thought absolutely for certain that person or that situation was an angel, but I know that angels have protected me. I know that there are, there, there, I had one situation uh, many, many years ago as a young man in the Navy where I came that close to death. I mean that close. I, I saw my life flash before my eyes. I had to thank God that, and I'm just saying, it must have been an angel that saved me. Amen. But we have angels as ministering spirits. Here's Michael, the mightiest of the angelic creatures, standing up in the defense of the people of God. Now, <clears throat> when we analyze the text, we recognize in the next phrase that Daniel says, there's a time of trouble coming. Now, now Michael, being the greatest of all of God's beings, is the one who's going to stand in the gap, so to speak, to keep it from being quite so bad and to prevent the utter and complete destruction of Israel. You know, Satan's been after Israel ever since the beginning because Israel was the means through which the Messiah would come to save us. So Satan's always stood against the people of Israel. But Daniel, or rather Michael, will stand in the gap to prevent the utter destruction of, 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 uh, of Israel. We know this from other places in the Word of God. For example, in Jude verse 9, we read that Michael is the one who fought with the devil over the body of Moses. We just read recently in Daniel 10 of Michael's assistance to Gabriel in battling the prince of Persia so that Daniel could receive this message of warning. No doubt Michael was involved in that. We read in Revelation 12 of an attempt by Satan to destroy the Messiah at his birth. And we recall what Herod did to try to make that come true. No doubt Michael was involved. This should surprise us not then that God will send him once again to provide protection for his people during the great tribulation. In fact, in Revelation 12, it specifically tells of a time where Michael will actually go to war to protect Israel. Revelation 12 and verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, war, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And so Michael, fighting for the Lord and with his uh, army of angels, defeats Satan and his army of demons and casts them out. 
Perhaps this is where the demons lose some of their power or simply overcome by the power of God. John goes on to write, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying now salvation and strength, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. In other words, Michael's going to give Dan or give Mike, or Michael's going to give Satan the boot and he knows that he can't ever get back into heaven again and he's going to come down and his full wrath is going to be released on the earth primarily against the people of Israel. Why? Because he knows that his days are numbered. He knows that his time is coming to an end. Daniel is warning the people of Israel by, about this, but he's giving them hope. There's going to be a time of distress, a time of trouble that is coming. There shall be a time of trouble. And Daniel says, there will never have been a time like this since there was a nation. There never will be anything quite like the unprecedented times uh, of the great tribulation. Now, here's the good news. <clears throat> if you know Jesus, you won't have to go through it. If you know Jesus, you're going to get taken out before that time comes. If somebody says, well, I think we're in the great tribulation now. No, well, if you're a Christian, we're not in it. Okay. We're either all lost or it's not the great tribulation. Amen. And so, but the time is coming. And so we have a great defender, but we also have a time of distress in Matthew chapter 24 and verse seven, our Lord says this nation will rise against nation kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Jesus goes on to say in verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. If you ever had any doubt that Daniel didn't know what he was talking about, Jesus said he did. Jesus affirms the words of Daniel. Jesus went on to say, let those who sleep in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray for your flight that it may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not has been seen since the beginning of the world to this time, nor never shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. We have previously seen the prophecies of Jeremiah and Zechariah and their comments on the end times, which coincide with what Jesus had to say about it. There will be a time of distress such as never has been seen on the earth before. But praise God, there will be a mighty deliverance. Daniel goes on to say at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone found written in the book. That's the great hope to which we have been alluding. But make no mistake, it is for those who are found written in the book. Romans eleven twenty six 26 declares this, and all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jeremiah shared the promise that Israel would be saved out of this day of trouble and that the Lord would save them. But we need to consider who exactly is going to be saved. Zechariah says in 13 and 8 of his prophecy that two thirds of Israel will be killed during the time of the great tribulation. That leaves one third and that's the ones who are going to be saved. God is going to save them. He is going to bring them to faith in Christ. Well, how can that be? Well, Revelation 11 tells us how it can be. If we were to study the book of Revelation, we would find in that chapter that God is going to set apart two witnesses with, with miraculous powers to preach the gospel. In fact, they are going to be so effective in preaching the gospel that when they do preach, people who oppose them, they're going to have the ability to blow fire out of their mouths and burn them up. I have always, Brother Kenny, wanted that kind of power in my preaching. Actually, I thought it would be really nice to have it in a deacon's meeting a time or two. 
The deacons oppose the pastor and you just go, they're burned up, sweep up the ash. Anybody else want to say anything? <laughs> but that's how these guys are going to preach. I mean, they're going to have amazing power. They're going to preach the gospel and anybody that opposes them, they're just going to blow them. Then they're going to be burned up. I'm telling you, that's a preacher you don't want to mess with. Amen. And so there are going to be those two great meetings. But then Revelation 7 and 14 tell us that God is going to raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists who are going to be saved and are going to go preach the gospel. They will be preaching and witnessing, and many will be saved under their ministries. This is the way a remnant will come to faith in Christ. In fact, eventually, God's going to put an angel in the sky to preach from a pulpit in the sky. And listen, if you don't get it by the time all of that is said, you're just dumb. I mean, you're just dumb if you don't believe the gospel at that point. But the truth of the matter is the book of Revelation tells us that it will still be rejected. This is the hope of Israel, that one day they will all be saved. And you know, I think Daniel's trying to say, why do you want to wait till then? Why do you want to wait till then? And what makes you think if you do wait till then that you'll even be saved when you see all of that happen and unfold as it's in Scripture? Well, secondly, we have the great promise of resurrection and judgment. Not only a great rescue, but a great promise of resurrection and judgment. Verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some will awake to everlasting life, but some will awake to everlasting contempt. We're reading here about the final resurrection. Now, one thing Jews could understand from the Old Testament was is that there was going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection. Even the Jews in the Old Testament understood that. Clearly, Abraham believed in a resurrection. Job said this, I know that my Redeemer lives and shall stand again upon the earth. After my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. What a great testimony from Job. Job went through some trouble, amen? And Job understood that there was going to be a resurrection. He said this, whom shall I see for myself and my eyes behold and not another? How my heart yearns within me. Our hearts ought to be yearning for the resurrection to see Jesus again. In chapter 26 of Isaiah, he predicted the resurrection. Hosea, a contemporary of Isaiah, also predicted it in chapter 13 of his prophecy. And David wrote this in the Psalms. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. You will not leave my soul in she hole, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. David believed in the resurrection. But what we need to understand is that there are two resurrections. There is the resurrection to everlasting life, and there is a resurrection that Daniel speaks here to everlasting contempt. Now, the everlasting life is the one that you want to be in on uh, Uh, It is the one that is spoken of as in the Bible as the first resurrection. In Revelation 20 and verse 5, the Bible says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first uh, resurrection. Jesus, of course, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, was Uh, the first fruits of the first resurrection. He set the whole thing in motion. We read earlier in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the church will be raptured out and finally will become the resurrection of all the Old Testament and tribulation saints. In other words, those who get saved during the tribulation time and those who were saved in the Old Testament. In Revelation 20 and verse 4 we read, I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then, John says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast nor his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until those thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part In the first resurrection, over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Look, you want to be in that crowd. That's the resurrection you want to be in on. 
Because not only is there a resurrection to everlasting life, there is a resurrection of shame, a resurrection of everlasting contempt. The latter part of verse of Revelation 20 and verse 6 spoke of a second death. And then in Revelation 20 and verse 7, John begins to speak of that. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison. And then verse 11 tells us this, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There will be no place found for them. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen, you can stand before God and be judged on the basis of your works. You can make the decision, as many do, who think that the good that they have done in this life will gain them some stead with God, that will gain them some position with God. But the Bible says that those that are judged by their works will be cast into a lake of fire, separated from God forever. And the only ones that will be admitted into heaven is those whose names are written in the book of life. That's the only way to get in. And the only way to get in that book is not by being a good boy or a good girl. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ and no other way. You cannot be saved any other way. So you can bring me your report card and you can bring me a list of references and witnesses on what a great person you are. And God bless you. The rest of us are appreciative of your goodness, but your goodness will not get you into heaven. Only the blood of Christ can accomplish that. You've got to surrender. You've got to turn from your sin, place your faith and trust totally in Christ and surrender to his lordship over your life. Jesus said it very plainly in John chapter 5. Don't marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Hear me. Those who have done good could only do good because they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The only righteousness that you can, you and I can have is his righteousness worked in and through us by his Holy Spirit. Hear me. You have no personal righteousness. You have no personal goodness. The only way that you can do anything good is to have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was saying is those that have done good, those that have been genuinely saved, they're the ones that are going to be resurrected to everlasting life. And those that have done evil are going to go to a resurrection of condemnation or contempt. And so we've seen the great rescue. We have seen the great promise of resurrection and judgment. But in verse 3, we get the great promise of reward. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is a very important point because with this promise of rescue and resurrection, there's a promise of reward. Aren't you glad that God rewards? I am. I'm looking forward to that day. And so Daniel says there are two types of folks that are going to get rewarded here, the wise and the righteous. Now, the wise, you are wise to receive Christ and follow him. You're a fool if you don't. Now, the wise, that is the word sokol in Hebrew. It means to look upon, to have insight, to give attention to to ponder, to be prudent, to have insight and comprehension. In other words, it would do you well to get insight and comprehension into the things of God, to be wise about the plan of salvation, to be wise about what it means to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life, to be wise to understand that you're a sinner who needs a Savior, that you're a sinner who must repent and come to full faith and trust in Christ, that you're a sinner who needs to submit to the authority of Christ. That's wise. And when you get wise, in the end, in every everlasting life, you'll shine like the brightness of the firmament. He's talking about the sun and the moon. That's what he's talking about. You know, you're going to shine like the sun. 
Somebody said to me one day, I said, boy, we got to shine like the sun today. He said, it's cloudy. I said, yeah, but if you get on the other side of the clouds, it's shiny. Hello? You get on the other side of the cloud. Y'all have been there. You've gone to the airport. You've gotten on the plane. It's a cloudy day. Maybe there's some mist, maybe even some rain. It's dark down here, but you get on that plane and it gets up and it goes through those clouds and it gets on the other side. And once you get on the other side of the clouds, what you got? Sunshine. Blessed sunshine. Well, he says that if you're wise, you're going to be shining like the firmament in eternity. I don't know exactly what that means, but I do know this. The Bible says that those of us that know Jesus are going to get a body like his and his body shone. I, I, I don't understand all that, but I sure want to find out. Amen. Now, there's another group of folks that are promised a great reward, and that's the righteous. You know who the righteous are? They're actually the witnesses, the wise and the witnesses. The righteous are they who turn many to righteousness. The only way a person can be righteous is to be saved. The only way a, per a person can be righteous, the only way a person can be right with God is to come to saving faith in Christ. Then what happens is that great exchange from 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what the choir was singing about, his robes for mine. Your robe of sin was put on him on the cross and his robe of righteousness was put on you. What a great exchange. He got your sin, you get his righteousness. Hallelujah, boy, that ought to make somebody happy. But that's good preaching, whether you like it or not. I mean, that's the gospel. That's what we're talking about, folks. And he says, so, so the wise, the witnesses who are turning others to righteousness, what are they going to be like? They're going to be like the stars that shine forever and ever. You know, <clears throat> when I was in school, they did not have student of the month. You know, they expected all of us to be the student of the month to do our work and turn it in. But I'm really sad because my parents never got to put a bumper sticker on the back of their car that said that their son was student at the month at Mount Olive Elementary School. That just hurts my heart, you know? I got a bumper sticker one side, one time and put it on the back of my car. My wife made me take it off, but I put it on there. It said, my student can beat up your student of the month. Yeah, and he could. He was smart, though. He, his mama said, you're making him think your son is not smart that he can just fight. We both know he can fight, but he's also smart because he took after me. I said, yes, honey, I know. I took the bumper sticker off. <clears throat> but look what this says. The righteous, those who are witnesses, are going to be like the stars that shine forever and ever. You say, I thought all the stars were going to burn out. Not according to that verse. God says he's going to keep them going. You know God can put oil in the lamp, amen? And so these are they that are going to be rewarded. And the rewards themselves are very simple. We're going to shine as the lights in the firmament, the sun and moon, shine as the stars forever. In other words, what he is saying is, is that the reward that you get for serving the Lord, the, war, the reward you get for coming wisely to saving faith in Christ and being a witness for the Lord is eternal. It lasts forever. It just goes on forever. It never ends. Let me tell you, you're not going to get bored in heaven. Hello, you're not going to get bored in heaven. And so that's the great promise of reward. And then we have, finally this morning, the great promise of revelation. Daniel is told in verse 4 to shut up the words and seal the book. That may seem kind of strange. And then, then he says, but there are going to be many who are going to run true and, to and fro. And it, it's kind of a picture of confusion, you know. We, we had this saying when I was back in my, my early days in the Navy. We had this little say, saying that went like this. When in worry, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. Did y'all get that? When in worry, when in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. That is not the way to fix the problem. Amen. But that's the way it seems sometimes. Things would get chaotic, right? This is, this is, he's describing some chaos there. But what, what God says is that you seal it up, you shut up the words and seal up the prophecy. 
<clears throat> in other words, what God was saying, he wasn't saying hide it from everybody. What he was saying is, is that the sealing of the book is so important for this reason. It's a message that's so significant that Daniel had to make sure that it got in the right hands so that it didn't get destroyed and lost. And guess what? We still have it today. So it wasn't that he was saying, seal it up so nobody can ever get it. He was saying, shut it up and protect it and save it for the people of God and seal the book until the end of the time. When the end of the time comes, everyone will know that what you said was true. And then there's the seeking for answers. You know, prophecy, in spite of the prophecy conferences and the prophecy interest back that I recall in the 70s and 80s, and, and, and some, to some degree even today, people are still seeking for answers. You know, prophecy has either been overly dramatized or totally ignored. But many in the last days are going to be seeking for answers. He, he says, look, he says, many shall run to and fro. They're going to go to this person. They're going to go to that person. I, I get uh, texts and emails from people all the time. Uh, Brother Tom, what do you think about so-and-so? Brother Tom, will you watch this sermon and tell me what you think? But Brother Tom, what, is, this, is, this biblically, is this preacher biblically accurate? Let me tell you, if you know the Word of God, then you can know whether it's accurate or not. If it lines up with the word of God, it's accurate. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, if it speculates about things, it's not the word of God. All right. You know, just for example, in some of the, the, the prophetic movies and books that were written, you're, they're, they're depicting the rapture and they'll say, planes are going to crash. Trains are going to jump the track. Cars are going to go off the bridge. And the people that are, you know, and, and the reason for it is, is that they're, they're raptured out. The driver's raptured out. The pilot's raptured out. The train engineer's raptured out. And you'll see their clothes and their shoes there. Where, there's nothing that says we go and make it. It says we're going to be clothed. I'm thinking I'll get there and whatever I'm wearing and I'll get to change into my white robe. Amen. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that's going to happen. Let me tell you, I think that the rapture, there's going to be so few Christians, true Christians left, the church is going to march right on, right as the tribulation begins, and most of the pastors are going to still be in the pulpit. I do remember one of those old prophecy movies that I saw, and it was depicting a church before the rapture happened. And everybody's sitting around and the pastor's up there preaching. And then it depicts the same church the next Sunday after the rapture occurs and there's a few people missing. Not the pastor. And someone stands up and says, brother so-and-so, so sister so-and-so, well, they're, they're missing. Do you think, pastor, that this could be the rapture? And he says, well, yes, I do think it could be the rapture, but we left, we're behind, we're in it. This is the age of Aquarius. I thought that was pretty insightful. The church is just going to march right on. I think that the people taken out in the rapture is going to have so little impact, it won't make Fox News. Because they don't care about the, about the important stuff anyway. CNN will cover it. No, they won't. Nobody will cover it because so few people will be taken out. But there'll be a remnant. There'll be some, and mama's going to disappear right next to them. Daddy's going to disappear right next to them. Their son that's been telling them, mama, daddy, you need to read the book. And the book's going to drop, and they're going to be gone. And they're going to look at each other and go, huh, I wonder. And then they're going to get saved, you see. But then they're going to have to live through the tribulation. So people are going to run to and fro. And people are running to and fro looking for answers today. I have never, Pastor Landon and all my put-togethers, seen as many as so-called Christian leaders, preachers, leaving the faith. One right after the another, we're hearing about those who were Christians, uh, Christian musicians, uh, 
Christian youth leaders, Christian pastors, uh, contemporary Christian people who have some kind of a name. Uh, for one example of that would be Joshua Harris. He was big in the purity culture movement, wrote, wrote the book, uh, Why We Kiss Dating Goodbye. Totally out of the faith, divorced his wife, left his wife, left his family, completely rejected Christianity. And it's happening over and over. Read about another one this week. I didn't recognize him. Apparently, he's supposed to be popular, but I don't follow that crowd, so I didn't know who he was. But he left the faith. Never seen so much of that. And what they're doing is they're running to and fro, chaotically, looking for an answer, and Jesus is the answer. Someone smart eloquently said to me one time, as I had said, Jesus is the answer. And they said, what's the question? And I said, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the question is. Jesus is the answer. So Daniel, you take this book and you seal it up because one of these days people are going to be seeking the answers and the only place they're going to be found is in the word of God. That's the only place they're going to be found. Now, number five, the great promise of refining and retribution. How is all this going to take place? And how are we to react and respond? You'll have to come back next Sunday to find out. Amen? Because I don't have time to preach that fifth point this morning. But that's what we're going to look at next Sunday. So here's what I want to say to you as we come to our time of invitation this morning. And I've been saying this for almost 40 years. But if I was saying it 40 years ago, and it was true then... It's 40 years more true today. Church, it is time for us to get up off of our blessed assurance and get about the business of serving God. It is time for us to get serious about sharing the gospel. I'm telling you, the day is coming where they're going to say, you cannot go in anywhere in the public square and leave a track. It is going to, it is going to get illegal to take a track and leave it. It's going to be illegal. It's going to be illegal for the Gideons to take a Bible and put it in a hotel room. It's going to be illegal for us to go on the campus and share the gospel with students. Those guys that work with Great Exchange, some of my fellow Great Exchange guys ran into a preacher and they were at a, I think at a coffee shop, or maybe it was a restaurant, I don't know. But they, he, so they got to talking, and he told them that he had done his PhD in evangelism. And they said, well, look, here's what we're doing for evangelism. Why don't you come join us and get on the campus? And because, I mean, you got a PhD in evangelism. You know what a PhD is, right? Well, I think sort of stood for piled high and deep. But he didn't want to go out and share the gospel. You know, we've got seminaries who talk about evangelism, but they don't ever actually go out and tell anybody about Jesus. Church, I'm telling you, it's time for us to get serious. We, we need the baptismal waters to start getting stirred. Well, they're not going to get stirred if you don't start telling somebody about Jesus. So well, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. Tell them what the Bible says about being saved. Grab a track and read it to them. So they won't listen. That's not your job. Your job is not their ears. Your job is your mouth. We need to start telling people about Jesus. Here's what we've been told about our great exchange because of the, because of the pandemic. I'm just giving you an illustration here. There are no students on campus. Not going to do you any good to go. So last Monday, we were at Georgia State Newton. I pulled up in the parking lot. The place is empty. I'm like, whoa. I mean, the parking lot was empty compared to other times I've been there. But we set up our tent, and we got our stuff ready to go. And we had 11 gospel conversations, and five students prayed to receive Christ. Last Monday, Georgia State Newton. There's nobody there. Apparently, there is somebody there. Tomorrow, I'm going to load up, and I'm going to go on to the campus at Georgia Tech. They've been telling us through the whole pandemic, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. But we're going tomorrow, and I'll bet you we're going to talk to some students about Jesus. We may not as many as we have before, but we're going to do it. On Wednesday, I'm going to be at Gordon State up here in Barnesville. If you want to go with me, come on. 
You want to see how to share the gospel? I'll show you. We're going up to Gordon State in Barnesville, and we're going to share the gospel. On Thursday, I'm going to South Carolina. Y'all know them people in South Carolina are heathens, don't you? That's like foreign mission territory. I'm going over to the University of South Carolina. Wouldn't y'all like to see some Gamecocks get saved? Well, I would. We've probably had 25 or 30 saved at the University of Georgia just this year. Because that's one of the places that we could get on and go. And we have so many different groups in Athens that help us. We've got churches that actually care that college students are dying going to hell. And they'll get on the campus and talk to them about Jesus. How about that? Well, the people you live around, the people you go to school with, the people you work with. We need to start talking. We need to be serious. Because like Daniel said, they're running to and fro. They're confused as a termite and a yo-yo. And the only thing to clear that confusion is the gospel of Christ. Father, in Jesus' name, we have a great commission that you have given us to share the gospel. The end is coming. Now, it may not come in our lifetime. The rapture may not come in our lifetime. It, it may be hundreds of years off. Oh, there sure is an awful lot of stuff going on in the world that would lend us to believe and think that the end could be near. And the truth is, is that we all know life is short. So individually, the end could be near for any of us. We don't know what our days are on this earth. If by reason of hope, they are 70 or 80 years, wonderful, but we don't know. And so, Father, give us a heart for the gospel. Everybody in this room has lost family members, lost friends that we could be praying for and witnessing to and sharing the gospel with. God, give us the courage to do what you've called us to do. Help us to follow through on the commission that you have given us to be obedient because the time is short. The word of God says, behold, now is a time in an acceptable time. I have listened to you. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Father, help us to be faithful to that. I pray this morning that there'll be some that will come and just get right with you in the altar today and just repent of our not sharing the gospel like we ought to. If you're here this morning and you don't have a church home, then my prayer for you is, is that you would come and unite with Tabernacle Baptist Church and help us to be a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, gospel-sharing, devil-hating, sin-despising church. Now, Father, I pray this morning that if there's anyone here that's lost and undone without Christ, that they would have the courage, that you would draw them to yourself, that they would have the courage to publicly profess their repentance, faith, and surrender to Christ as Lord. May it be so for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.